Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Alpha Biolab's latest breakfast webinar entitled Discover the Latest in Drug Testing for the Legal Sector. By way of introduction, my name is Andrew Priestley, and I'm the Sales and Marketing Manager for the Legal Sector here at Alpha Biolabs. And I'm joined today by my colleagues, Ashley Hodgkinson, who's our Sample Collections Manager, and Marie Davis, who is our Toxicology Reporting Manager. In terms of the agenda, we've broken the webinar down into three sections, really. The first section is really a sort of opener and icebreaker where I'll just talk about the latest trends in types of drugs being used illegally in the UK. I'll then hand over to Ashley, who's going to talk about how we collect and test different sample types. And then Marie is going to talk about how to interpret our court-approved drug test reports. Now, our reports are designed to be user-friendly, but often we get feedback from clients like yourself to, to ask about more of the sort of technical um, jargon that we put in the report. So Marie's going to talk about those aspects of the report. As per usual, we'll also finish the webinar with, with the questions and answers section. So please do use the Q&A function, which you will have access to on your on the Zoom technology to ask any question that you have throughout the webinar. We'll then collate those questions and we'll answer as many as we can given time at the end. There's also a short post webinar survey that will appear before you log off at the end of the webinar. I would appreciate it if you could kindly complete that because your, your feedback is really invaluable to us it will literally take you less than a minute to do. Okay, so let's get started. So I'm just gonna talk briefly about the latest trends in types of drugs being used illegally in the UK. And I've, I've been reading a report from the Office for National Statistics. Uh, it's entitled Drug Misuse in England and Wales. And it's for the year ending June, 2022. It's for a 12-month period, so it's really for the period when we were coming out of the COVID pandemic. Um, and if we look at the bullet points I've listed on the screen, if we look at the first three, so 9% of adults aged 16 to 59 years and 19% of those aged 16 to 24 had used drugs in the previous 12 months, according to the report. 2.6% of adults aged 16 to 59 had reported being frequent users of drugs in other words, using them more than once a month in the past year. And also 7.4% and 16.2% of adults aged 16 to 59 and 16 to 24, respectively, used cannabis in that previous 12 months. Now, what the report also said was it compared it to two years um, prior to that. This report tends to be produced every two years. And it said for all those different scenarios there, the 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 amount of usage was roughly the same, nothing had really changed. However, the last bullet point you can see there, 3% of adults aged 16 to 59 and 5% of adults aged 16 to 24 use class A drugs. And that was actually down by approximately 20% on the period before COVID. So what the report went on to suggest was that due to the heavy government restrictions and the reduction in social contact, that definitely had an impact on the usage of class A drugs during that time. And this uh, slide here, this graph, um, just breaks it down a bit more for you so you can see that drug by drug, really. So if you look at the, um, the class A drugs, so powder cocaine, um, ecstasy, amphetamines, we can see LSD as well. We can see the reduction um, of usage but what's also interesting about this graph is if we look at some of the class B and C drugs, we can see that actually during COVID, there was an increase in usage of those drugs. So, for example, magic mushrooms, ketamine, uh, an anabolic steroids and the new psychoactive substances. So COVID quite clearly has had an impact in the sort of the drug landscape, the makeup of the different types of drugs that, um, that people are using illegally. And I've just put in here a couple of examples, what we call the new kids on the block. You might have heard of these two, but these, again, coming out of COVID, based on this 
change in the sort of use of class A, B and C drugs, what we're finding is the increased use of poly drugs, where at least two drugs are mixed together. So one that we've heard of is pink cocaine or Tootsie, um, which you might have heard of, but it's relatively new. It's come out of the out of America. And it's an unbalanced mix of MDMA or ecstasy and ketamine. It's obviously synthetically made and it's increasingly pre prevalent in the club scene across Europe. It's got no relation to cocaine, despite the name. It's provided in pill or powder format and its effects include strong hallucinations, which can last for up to eight hours. And it's often mixed with other drugs like fentanyl, which can sadly prove fatal. Another one that's been around a bit longer, which you might have heard of as well, is Calvin Klein, which is actually a mixture of cocaine and ketamine. It's similar effect to ecstasy, and it's been on the US club scene for a while now, but it's, there's been increasing number of incidents being reported in the UK, and sadly that can also be deadly. So just on that, I just wanted to remind you, so our standard drug panel, you can see listed there the 12 main drugs that we test for, which for example includes ketamine, um, is part of our standard drug panel. So what I would say is we have a drug screen plus service, which is a free service. So say, for example, you have a court order to test for cocaine. We will obviously do that testing for you. But through our drug screen plus service, we can also test for any of the other drugs in our standard drug panel. So, for example, if you have a client who was actually using pink cocaine, then as well as testing for cocaine, through Drug Screen Plus, we would we would probably identify that there's some ecstasy and ketamine in their hair sample. So I just wanted to mention that to, to you. In addition, we could also test for other drugs listed there, including magic mushrooms, LSD, tramadol, steroids, and the newer psychoactive substances, including spice and GHB. And that, if we move on to the next slide, that's another reason or another change that we're seeing in the landscape at the moment. And only recently, uh, you can see listed there, the Home Office um, have added 11 more NPSs to Class A of the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971. And I've listed the names there. You, you might be aware of some of them, probably not. Um, I'm not going to pronounce them, um, but they're there listed for you. If you're interested in reading more about that, then please visit our website blog where we've got a more detailed article on that. But again, that's just another example of how these NPSs are becoming increasingly prevalent in, in the UK as well. Okay, hopefully you found that useful. So if you have any questions on that, drop them in the Q&A. But with that, I'm going to hand over to Ashley now, and she's going to talk about how we collect and test different sample types. Hello, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm just going to go through the options that you have when you're looking to do a drug test, what types of samples we can take, what information they will provide. Um, and that's really the, the key indicator as to which samples are the best to take. It's what information you're looking to obtain from the results. Um, so the first and probably the most popular type of test that we do for drugs would be to use a sample of head hair. Um, head hair is looking to identify persistent drug misusers. So we're not looking at one-off use. We're looking at persistent users when we analyze head hair. Theoretically speaking, a head hair sample can allow up to 12 months worth of information. So can, we can look back up to 12 months using a sample of head hair, dependent upon the length of it. Um, so if you took a sample, for instance, of my head hair, you could go back up to 12 months. For someone with much shorter head hair, you would be restricted by the length of it. So again, it's something to consider dependent on what information you're looking for from the results as to whether head hair would be sufficient in going back far enough. So how can we tell you how much of a time frame a head hair sample can cover? And um, well, head hair grows at an average rate of a centimetre per month. So if you had a client who had, for instance, three centimetres of head hair, you would be able to look back over a three month time frame. That, again, may be sufficient for what you're looking to identify, or you may look to seek an alternative sample collection method, be that body hair, um, in order to cover the time frame that you're looking for. There are two types of 
um, analysis available when we're looking at testing head hair. So they would be called overview or segmented analysis. So I'm just going to show you an example of what those two things mean and how you would decide which one was more suitable for your client. So this is an example of an overview analysis. So an overview is a larger segment of her that covers a wider time frame. Each seg each overview segment, sorry, can cover up to three months. So you can see here on the graph, you have a sample of head hair that measures 12 centimeters, which would cover approximately 12 months. Um, however, if you opted for an overview, we would break that down into four segments, each covering a three month time frame. So you would get four results, one for each individual three months worth of analysis. Um, when this would be beneficial to your client, um, it would be if you were, had an understanding of what the results would be looking like. Um, so if you kind of knew that your, your client had abstained in the beginning and then maybe used later on, you might opt for this type of test. Um, if you're looking at more specific timeframes, you would then look to opt for a segmented test, which would look like this. So again, if your client had 12 centimetres of head hair, you could provide a 12 month analysis. And we would break that down month by month. So you would get 12 individual results for that 12 centimetres of head hair. This is the most beneficial. This is the one that we would recommend um, if you're looking at patterns and trends within someone's use. So if you were looking to see if there had been an increase or a decrease in someone's use, or if they were using, say, at the beginning of the testing period and then had abstained later on, and you wanted to see if the pattern was reflective of that, you would want to do a segmented test. It's a much more detailed report um, than the overview, which is looking at three month segments as a whole. Just to clarify exactly what type of analysis we can provide um, depending on the length of your client's head hair, and that is really what it comes down to as to what we're able to provide. Um, if you were looking at having three months worth of analysis, your client would need a minimum of three centimeters of head hair. And then we can report it either as one result for that whole time frame as an overview or three individual results, one for each month if it's segmented. And then the same for six months. If you're looking to go back six months, we need six centimeters of head hair and you can have it as an overview with two individual results, one covering each monthly segment. Um, or you can have it segmented where you would get six individual results, one for each month that we tested. But again, it's all dependent upon what you are looking at for information, how far back you want it to go, and if your client has sufficient head hair for us to be able to look back. So what do we do if your client doesn't have sufficient head hair? Um, it may be that they don't have the sufficient length for what you're looking for, or it may be that they're not comfortable in providing a head hair sample and you're wanting to explore some alternative methods. And um, we can take a body hair sample. So for drug testing, we can take most things, including underarm, chest, back, forearm, as long as there is a sufficient sample amount. And the collector that comes out to take that sample would be able to advise. Um, this type of sample would only provide an overview analysis, though body hair cannot be segmented. So it would be up to a 12 month period as an overview. So it's something to bear in mind if you are looking at patterns and trends. Um, this may not be the most suitable type of test for you because you are just getting that one result as an overview. Um, beard hair, dependent upon the length, can potentially go back up to 12 months. Um, beard hair is applied with a time frame. So we would need to look at the length that your client had to be able to advise um, as to the, the time that we can look back with the drug testing. But beard hair is different to body hair. Um, it isn't 12 months as an overview as standard. It is dependent upon the length of the beard hair available. And then you've got fingernails and toenails that we can collect. Toenails will cover up to 12 months as an overview and fingernails will look back up to six months as an overview. Um, it does have to be your client's nails. They can't have acrylics or shellac or gel polish or anything like that. And they do need to be clean. Um, but that is, again, another option if the head hair isn't available um, or isn't a suitable length. Some other options that we can provide if you're looking at a more shorter time frame. So if you're not wanting to go back months, if you're wanting to just look at what is in the client system short term, um, the first option we would look at would be an oral fluid test. 
So we can come out and collect a sample of oral fluid from your client and provide results for the previous 48 hours. Um, so again, just a short time frame for oral fluid. We're not looking back as far as head hair, but it's usually used for one of two main reasons. The first one is to bridge the gap between the collection um, and the head hair sample starting because we have to allow for the growth or it can be used um, for cases where maybe someone has contact with the child. So you are just looking at the, the most recent use. Alternatively to oral fluid testing, we can offer urine testing. Um, so this is still a short time frame, but a little bit longer than oral fluid. This will look back up to four days um, and can test up to 14 drugs. Uh, the only exception to this would be for cannabis. Um, that can remain um, present in a urine sample for up to 28 days if it is a chronic user. Um, so it's something to bear in mind dependent upon what you are looking to ascertain from the results. So how do we collect the samples? We have a sample collections team um, who are out on the road every day visiting people in many different settings, in their homes, um, at solicitors' offices, at contact centres. If it's not suitable for your client to be visited at home or one of those locations, we also have 13 walking clinics based up and down the UK, which you can see on this map. Um, they're open on certain days where as long as you have a case registered with us, your client can book in to go along um, and provide a sample there if that's more comfortable for them. We completely appreciate that not everyone would want us to attend their home address and that they may opt for a walk-in clinic instead. And that is a free sample collection at the walk-in clinic. Um, if a walk-in clinic's not suitable, like I say, we can arrange to meet them at their home address um, or at your offices or at a contact centre or another suitable location dependent upon your client's needs. At all sample collection appointments, it's really important that we maintain a chain of custody. And we do that with many different steps, um, including identifying the donor at the time of the appointment, asking that they provide ID where possible, and always taking a photograph of the person who presents themselves for the sample collection. And that photograph will be included in the report so you can see that the correct person attended. The samples track to every stage from collection to when the report is issued for you um, and the sample is returned to the laboratory by the collector, it's never left in the presence of the donor. Um, and everything is sealed with tamper-proof tape so that you can be sure that it isn't tampered with at any stage of the process. So this is just a little summary table before I hand over to Marie in just a moment um, about what the different options are, what types of samples we can take and what detection window they would offer for you. Um, so we've got our head her there. So like we said, we can go back up to 12 months segmented or we can offer three, six, nine or 12 months as an overview, depending on what it is you're looking to ascertain from the results. Um, body hair would be a 12 month overview, um, as would toenails. Fingernails would be a six month overview. Urine is four days and oral fluid up to 48 hours. And then the only different one in there is your beard hair, potentially up to 12 months as an overview. However, it is dependent upon the length of the client's hair at the time of the appointment. If you are ever unsure as to what sample you are wanting your client to provide, it may be that they want to provide beard hair, but we're not sure if it's sufficient. We can always take two types of samples as long as we're aware that that's the requirement and then judge it from the analysis based upon the length of the beard hair when it arrives. And finally, just before I hand over, the main things to consider before you do instruct testing um, and arrange for us to go out and visit your client is to be sure that you're doing the right test for the case. Um, so we want to consider a few things, why the test being done and what we're looking to find out from it. And um, so if we are looking at patterns and trends, ideally, we want a segmented test with a sample of head hair. Um, what detection period you're wanting to cover and whether your client has a sufficient sample for that and then how the test is going to be funded. And all of these things we can help you with at the stage of instruction. We can advise on what the most suitable test would be. Um, and like I say, we can review it at the time of the appointment as well. If we arrive and the client sample that you've requested isn't suitable, the head hair might not be long enough. We can always look at that stage to take an alternative. So I'm just gonna hand over to Marie, who's gonna talk you through how to interpret the court approved drug test reports. 
Good morning. Um, I'm here to talk this morning about how to interpret our court approved drug test reports. I'm going to cover over the general aspects of hair testing, covering collection, storage, decontamination, segmentation, extraction, the analytical techniques used, and interpretation. So following receipt of the head hair sample at our laboratory, it's prepared by the, the segmenting team and they will cut it to the, the desired length. If there's any issues with the hair length of the sample, that's when you will be contacted to discuss any options um, that will be different from what you have requested. Uh, following segmentation, each segment is then decontaminated. And this basically just removes anything that's on the outer surface of the hair, which can include um, external drug contamination as uh, from smoked drugs or from anything that's touched the hair. And it will also remove anything that will interfere with the analytical techniques which are going to be undertaken in the laboratory. So then after decontamination, we go for extraction and purification. So before extraction, the hair samples are homogenized uh, to basically just make it more, uh, we're getting a representative sample of, uh, for the analysis. Each head hair grows in its own um, time period. So what, we, and a head hair sample collected at the same time from the same person can have slightly different levels of jokes. So we just try to homogenize that to make sure that we're getting a representative sample of what is in the hair within that segment. Following that, it's extracted and purified. So what we're doing is we're isolating any drugs and metabolites or alcohol markers which are in the hair. They're then purified for then going onto the um, analytical techniques. And here we, we don't do a screening technique. We go directly to confirmatory analysis, which uses chromatographic methods with mass spectrometry. So whatever we detect is definitively that substance and it's not a, um, a false positive. So it will be what is in the hair and it will be a specific drug or drug metabolite. And following on from that, we go into the um, interpretation and reporting. So once the results are obtained, um, there are two ways of having the report produced to you. Uh, you may have a certificate of analysis, which is the standard result. So it would just be a, a certificate which gives you anything that's been detected in the hair and at what level it's been detected. And then we have an additional um, uh, reporting side, which is the statement of witness. And that covers any interpretive issues. So um, the, the on-site on team of um, toxicologists will interpret the results with taking into consideration everything in the case. So we look at the hair sample, any hair treatments, any, any other things that may kind of affect um, what, what we're re reporting within the report. Thank you. So I've talked about this a little bit already, sorry. So the, the samples are there. Um, so we've got the toxicologists, we're all impartial. So we, we look at the results and we interpret them as we, we, from our experience and our training. So it's an impartial interpretation of what, what we see in the hair. So they should be easy to understand. They should be clear and concise and hopefully give you the interpretation and conclusion which you require. Uh, that we provide them within the family law procedure rules and we um, have a, um, all the information disclosed at the end of the document that will cover that shows you that we've um, um, complied with that uh, requirement. So this is just um, going to be a few screenshots of, of what you will see in the report. So in this one um, starts off with a small summary. So this isn't the interpretation, this will just be um, a, a summary of what has been detected or what has, has not been detected in the hair. So whatever drug groups are requested, it will state within there, it's a small summary, there's no interpretation. So we won't address any changes in, in, in levels or whether or not it's consistent with the declaration. It would just be a quick summary of what we have in the hair. So going on to the, the next part, it's the donor and sample information. So this is everything that's at the time of the collection. So it, it will give you the new unique case number, the donor's name, the date of birth, the collection date, the receipt date at the laboratory, the collector who collected the sample. Most, in most cases, it will be the Alpha Bio Labs collector that's come out, a fully trained collector, and then the chain of custody. If you're getting a, a statement in, in a case, it will always be um, intact and complete because we won't report a sample where the chain of custody has actually been broken. 
So then we have the donor identification. So we have a photograph, which will be then shown further later on in the document under sample donor identification. So you can go and see the photo of the donor that was taken at the collection. And then if it's we have photographic identification, we will also detail that. So it could be a passport, we'll give the passport number. If it's a driving license, we'll give the driving license number and any, any deviations. So if it's expired, if it's provisional, is normally detailed in that section there under donor identification. So this now comes to the request. So in this case, we've actually tested um, that what has been requested, but sometimes if body hair has been collected, in here it's scalp hair that's been requested and the sample type analyzes is scalp hair. If it was any other sample, it would be detailed there and the if any reason has been provided, that will also be detailed there. So in this case, the approximate length of the sample is four centimetres. And luckily, four centimetres was requested so we could actually um, meet the requirements of, of the request. In this case, Drug Screen Plus was also requested. And if Drug Screen Plus is requested, it will be here if it's positive for any other additional drugs. If it's negative, it will be detailed at the end of the document that the statement stating that, that no additional drugs were detected. So in this case, we've got cannabis and cocaine, but we've also identified MDMA within the hair using the Drug Screen Plus service. So then we go on to the sample donor disclosures. Here, we take into consideration anything that's disclosed at the sample collection. So any medications that are used, some of the drugs that we test for, it's like opiates, codeine, morphine, or are also prescribed, diazepam. So that if they're detailed as, as part of the pre prescribed medications, it will all be detailed here under the medications and substances disclosures. We also disclose the information about any um, illicit drug use. So, and then we'll put the what the donor declares to us at the time. So cannabis use weekly and at the, any date of last use. And then the cocaine has also been disclosed there. So then we also go on to um, environmental exposure to drugs. So if the, an individual is um, in, an air, in a flat sharing or is in an area where drugs are used, this will be detailed here. And it will also uh, detail whether or not they're in close contact with a, a drug user. If it's specified what drugs they're in contact with, the drug user uses, that will also be detailed there. And then this is a really next important part in hair testing is the use of any treatment. Um, in this case, it's no treatment has been used. Um, so they've not disclosed any cosmetic hair treatments and no products have been used. If we see any indication that there is any um, cosmetic treatment to the hair, so we might see a dye line, we might see color changes, that will then be detailed below. So we don't just go on the disclosure of what the, the donor has said, we also look at the hair sample and take that into consideration too. So that will be de detailed underneath the last bullet point, any changes that we see. So if there's a dye line at one centimeter, two centimeters. If there is a color change that's out with the testing period, we don't tend to detail that because it would not affect the results of the testing. It's only whether or not it will affect the results that are going to, going to be obtained from the hair sample. So then this is, the segmentation. So this will tell you the process that's happened in the lab. If you remember earlier on, we, the hair sample only measured four centimeters. And when short, short hair samples, um, they, they tend to um, get very um, light towards the end of the sample because of you know different growth rates and also with, with the way the hair can be cut. So in this case, if there's any deviation from just using the A sample, it will be detailed in here that the two samples that were taken at the collection, the A and B, were combined to make up the weight required for the analysis. And that can happen more frequently with short samples because of the way it, it tapers towards the end of the hair sample. So you always get the most, the majority of the hair weight at the scalp end, but as you move dis more distally away, it can become finer and fewer hairs are reaching the maximum length. So that will be detailed there. And then we give you the time periods, but again, this is an approximate time period. So every, everything in hair testing is based on, a, on an average time period of one centimeter growth per month. Obviously this can deviate slightly from that, but it just allows you to give you a generalized cut segmentation of 
possible time periods. But the most important thing with, with segmented hair analysis is that it shows any changes in use. So if, if, if it slightly deviates from the disclosure of use, it's not too important. It's whether or not it's, it's, there's any changes in use with segmental hair analysis. So the time period's there just for kind of guidance rather than it being a set time period covered by that segment. So here we have the results. And as you can see, here we say it's in addition to MDMA. So this will also detail the Drug Screen Plus service. So we've got cannabis, the segmentation for cannabis shown below, but then also the segmentation for MDMA, which is also tested positive in this case using the Drug Screen Plus service. So here you can see that um, the levels, it gives a range which is um, high for the M MDMA a medium for the cannabis. This doesn't relate to an amount of drug use. Due to individual genetics with individuals and drug purity of illicit drugs and seasonal changes, hair growth rates, homogenization of the hair samples, it doesn't relate to a definitive level of use. And that again is complicated with any care treatments because they can reduce what is detected in the hair. And here you see the THC is actually decreasing towards the scalp and the MDMA is actually increasing towards the scalp, which could show levels of use. But as I'll discuss in a, a little while, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's any, it's, it's definitive changes in use. So in the report, following the tables of results, you'll get an explanation of each main drug that's been reported. So you will have the drugs that you've requested. So in this case, cannabis and co cocaine, and then also um, a, an explanation of MDMA. And so then it will be the, the hair sample reported on. So in this case, scalp hair was requested and it was also tested. So it will only give scalp hair, but if there's any body hair, if body hair was collected, we will also go into the body hair. Then it goes into the drug incorporation of hair. It will tell you the main mechanisms. And then we talk about the ranges as I've detailed previously, doesn't necessarily a, a level of use. It's just the range, which is statistically determined from the, from the positive samples that we have. And then we discuss external exposures, the washers, and then residual results after abstinence. So then we go into the effect of cos cosmetic hair treatments. Hair dye and bleaching damages the hair shafts. It, for the color or for the pigment to be removed or any color to be added to the hair shafts, the cuticle has to be opened. So that opening of the cuticle on the hair shaft also releases any drugs that are within there. So it, it can decrease them gradually over time. And there's a, there can be a buildup of effects of repeated cosmetic hair treatments. So sometimes, so with the MDMA, that could be the, where the concentrations are increasing towards the scalp. That could just be that the, the older, in this case, it, the hair wasn't treated, but it could be that the hair was treated and the decreasing concentrations away from the scalp are actually due to the leaching out of anything that was in the hair um, from, from any use within that time period. So then we talk about cutoff information and result information. And um, so that just covers everything, just kind of what you're going to see, um, anything that's important in, in that case, um, and negative results, because obviously we have a society of hair testing cutoff level. And then in some cases, the society of hair testing is not provided a cutoff level. So we use a laboratory cutoff level. So they're distinguished in the report as well, just so that you know which are the society of hair testing and which ones aren't. Um, and then we get the calibration ranges. Historically, uh, you may have noticed in the past couple of years that there's been a change. So when a lab um, basically um, uh, validates its method, we use a linearity. So we have a calibration curve where Basically, any, any level is detected within a specific, um, up to a certain level, and, and that's our highest calibration standard. And anything above that, we would report as, as a linearity, as statistics and mathematics, um, but we're no longer allowed to do that. So with the UCAS changes, um, due to changes in the how we report things, if anything is now above our top calibration range, you get a greater than symbol. Um, we can still see the results, but because it's it's a, a predicted level, it's not definitively on our on our ranges. So 
in the report, you'll get the conclusions. So any changes in use, any disclosures with cannabinoids, due to the way they are incorporated into the hair, they're mainly incorporated from sebum. Um, so as every hair follicle has a sebum gland attached to it, any sebum produced can contain the can cannabinoids that are present within the sebum. So what that means is, as the, as the hair is growing away from the scalp, it's being exposed to more sebum gradually over time. So that leads to a gradual increase in the levels of cannabinoids. The cannabinoids are there, but they're just being incorporated into the hair shafts longer. So with THC and the other cannabinoids, they tend to, even if somebody's using, they could be smoking cannabis every day or twice a week, the levels will always decrease towards the scalp just due to how they're incorporated into there. So that will be covered within the conclusion. And then if there's a change in disclosure, so if there's cessation or if they are reducing, we would normally address it into, into the um, uh, disclo into the conclusion there for you. So then we go on to the disclosures um, of, of, as, um, of, um, as, as expert witnesses. Um, then we have the sample donor identification photograph. It will then go into our qualifications and experiences, our declaration. And then finally, every report um, at um, Alpha Bio Labs is peer reviewed by a, a senior scientist. So you've got the collaborative, it's not one person making a decision, it is also approved by another scientist. And then finally, we have the reference section at the end of the report where you can see where we're getting our references from, where we're basing our main scientific um, um, assumptions on. That's great. Thank you very much, Marie and Ashley, for your presentations there. Hope everybody found those useful. OK, so we've got about five, six minutes or so to look at questions and answers. And um, thanks to all of you that have put some questions through. There's there's five or six that we have. So we'll do our best to answer all of those before we finish at quarter to ten. Um, I'll start with just a couple of questions in relation to um, sample collections. So these are for yourself, Ashley. The first one, uh, what happens if my client refuses to have their photograph taken at the time of the appointment? Um, so it's really important that we get that photograph taken at the time of the appointment so that we can prove who provided the sample. So if the donor sent someone else in to give the sample on their behalf, um, we can show evidence that this is the person that turned up to the appointment and we have had that in the past. So if it was taking place in a donor's home address and there was no one else there or they attended the walk-in clinic, we would refuse to take the sample from them. Um, however, if it was taking place in a solicitor's office and the solicitor was willing to sign on behalf of the donor to state that it's the correct person, then that's the only real option around it. Um, but nine times out of ten, it would be that we would abandon the appointment and rearrange um, when a solicitor could be present. That's great. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, another one in regard to um, sample collections with regard to nails. So do toenails or fingernails need to be of a minimum length? in order to have a sample collection? Um, yes and no. So yes, there is a minimum requirement for nails. However, what we will do is we will take a clipping from each individual nail. Um, so we'll take 10 clippings in total if there is sufficient nail there. Um, and then we'll have it weighed when it reaches the laboratory and they will determine whether it is sufficient for testing or not. Um, but to be completely honest, if we can clip it, it's usually sufficient if we can get a sample from each nail. So um, just enough for us to be able to clip the nails would be usually sufficient. That's great. Thanks, Ashley. And just following on from that, probably a question for Marie, really. So uh, one question that's coming is how accurate is toenail and fingernail testing? You there, Marie? Yes, sorry about that. I kept my mute button on. That's okay. Uh, they're very accurate. Um, there's been studies um, going on going for the last 10, 15 years. And um, in comparison, so nail samples and hair samples collected from the same individual. And you, you detect um, similar levels. So if somebody's using cocaine, it is in the nail, it is in the hair. If, if somebody's using um, whatever drugs. The only difference is for some reason, amphetamine um, is at higher levels in toenails and fingernails. So, but everything else tends to be quite similar. So they are, 
the Society of Hair Testing is covering nails this year, actually. Um, there's going to be a few because we are starting to see it more as an alternative if somebody can't provide a hair sample. Um, so it is a good way of actually um, finding long term uh, drug use or abstinence from toenails and fingernails. But they are, we are finding that they are um, they they are an alternative uh, matrix to hair samples. That's great, thank you. Another question for, for yourself, Marie. Can anything but head hair provide a segmented analysis? Unfortunately not. Um, scalp hair, because it grows to um, quite long lengths, the, the, the growth rate is quite consistent. Um, there's, the area we collect it from is the posterior vertex, which is just behind the crown, just underneath. And that's because the hair there is growing at the most constant rate and most hairs are actively growing. As soon as you move away from that, even towards the, the, the temples, the scalp, uh, the nape, you, you note, everyone will notice on their, own, on their own hair, you get shorter hairs at the front, shorter hairs at the rear. They don't grow to the same lengths as the main terminal hairs on the head. And then with body hair, um, much, there's a much higher proportion of hair in the resting phase. So we don't know the exact time period that that hair actually covers. So if you did segmental analysis, it, it, would, it would not demonstrate any changes in use. And with toenails and fingernails, because although a lot of people think they grow from the matrix, the, the bottom underside of the nail is all, also living. So up until the, the, the nail actually reaches the free edge and, and is no longer attached to the nail plate, um, uh, the, uh, the underbed, nails are still incorporating drugs so it's a whole integrated time period until it gets to the free edge and is available for a clipping that's great thanks marie okay just got time for a couple more questions that have been asked um again one for yourself marie last one for you i've had a few occasions recently where a sample has failed due to quality control issues what is this and why does it happen um, this is due to the new um, UCAS uh, requirements for Lab 51. So basically we have, um, we have to run uh, many more quality controls and they all have to pass. Um, with hair testing, it's, quite, it's not as straightforward as other testing. There's so many things involved. There can be contaminants on the hair. They can, people put products on the hair and they can be difficult to move during the decontamination process. Um, they, there can be um, just analytical variation on the day and, and, and an, any analytical result is just what is captured on that day. And there will, if it's run on a different day, there'll be slight variations and we can only operate within a selected range. So if any of our quality controls fall out with that range, we're not allowed to um, provide an analytical result. And then with, with cocaine, um, if we're only detecting cocaine and it's predominant metabolite, which is benzalecanine, we need to be able to do a calculation of a ratio on that one metabolite that's present to say whether it's indicative of use or whether or not we can't exclude it, external contamination. So if the benzalecanine um, on the quality controls on that fail, we can't provide a numerical result, which then in turn means we can't address whether it, it could be use or whether or not we can exclude con external con contamination. So that is where um, we, we do a recollection if there's no hair remaining, but the, the, there have been a lot of improvements. We've been working very hard in the laboratory and um, working on this and the number of issues that we have been having. There are a few teething problems at the beginning, but they are getting better and the number of issues of these are now reduced. That's great. Thanks, Marie. Uh, just got the time for one last question for yourself, Ashley. How many hair strands are required for a sample? Um, so per individual sample, we say it's approximately 200 strands of hair. Um, in the past, we have advised that it's roughly the width of a pencil. However, um, it has got a little bit confusing with clients who assume that that is the size of the patch that will be left on the head um, when it's actually the size of the sample when gathered together. Um, the bald patch that is left is significantly bigger dependent on how kind of close together the hairs are but 200 strands is the size of one sample and for every case the minimum amount of samples would be two um if you're doing drugs only it's two samples if you add alcohol in it goes up to three so 
up to three samples, 200 strands of her each. That's brilliant. Thanks very much. Thanks to all of you for submitting those questions. Um, we've answered as many as we could in the time we're given. So just to conclude the webinar then, so very briefly, so why choose Alpha Bio Labs? Well, as we've already mentioned, we can arrange sample collections from any UK address. We also have free collections from any one of our 13 uh, walking centres. Our drug test results are currently issued within seven working days of the receipt of the sample in the lab. As explained by Marie, they do tend to be user-friendly reports that we provide to you, and you do get access to dedicated account and case managers. We are UCAS accredited, ISO 17025 and ISO 9001. We do also have a special promotion on the moment. So any uh, quotation request you put in for drug testing between now and the end of April, we will apply a 15% discount if you quote the code DRUG15 on your quotation request form. You can do that in a number of ways. You can call our sales team on the number on the screen there, or you can email them at testing at alphabiolabs.com. Alternatively, visit our website, alphabiolabs.com, and you can actually request your quotation using an online form. So all that remains me to say really is thank you very much for your attendance. Um, there will be a very short webinar survey that will appear on your screen in a moment. Please do take a minute just to complete that your your feedback is invaluable to us for the planning of future webinars so would appreciate it if you could kindly do that so please do get in touch with us we are the experts in legal dna drug and alcohol testing all our main methods of contact are on the screen there for you we're also on social media on linkedin and twitter so do look us up on there if you're on there and give us a follow and we'll follow you back thanks once again to all of you for your time this morning uh, big thanks as well to Ashley and Marie for presenting, and we hope you found that a really useful webinar. Uh, have a great day, and we look forward to seeing you very soon on the next Alpha Bio Labs webinar. Thank you, and goodbye.